Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the AME Food Testing Show. Today's guests are John and AJ Barton. They are President and Chief Marketing Officer of MedEffect. It's a service related, disabled veteran owned small business and comprehensive providers of infection and microorganism control platforms for infection control and prevention, decontamination procedures, biopharma, QA, QC, biological safety, environmental hygiene, critical cleaning, microcleaning, janitorial, custodial, sanitation, mold, remediation, restoration, trauma, scene cleanup, and disaster relief providers. This new system is known as hydrogen peroxide fogging, food transport disinfection system. Today's outline and discussion is primarily based in their system, which is new. I'd like to now welcome John Barton and A.J. Barton. Gentlemen, can you update us on your current activities? Yeah, good morning, Andy. Um, Thank you for uh, having us on the show this morning. Um, Thank you. As you noted in the bio, um, for the last five years, uh, MedEffect has been involved in primarily critical environment cleaning, which is high-end laboratories, uh, animal laboratories, uh, pharmaceutical clean rooms, and other areas that uh, require specialized types of uh, gaseous uh, decontamination to facilitate uh, a type of sanitization that's required by a lot of the protocols in these environments. Uh, In the last number of years, uh, we've moved more aggressively into other areas that uh, need decontamination services as well to include healthcare, which is the big one, obviously, motivated by a lot of the medical reimbursement schemes from Medicare, uh, where hospital-acquired infections are not being reimbursed by the the federal government now if it can be be proven in a post-op environment. Uh, This has opened up a lot of opportunities because the the cost associated with not being paid for these infections is now going into preventive SOP protocols. Anyway, that, that, that is one market, but there's many others. Um, and food transport and food uh, processing systems have come up from time to time. Uh, we have looked at the food transport system and uh, from a decontamination perspective and think there are some significant opportunities there uh, to mitigate some of the issues associated with the uh, pathogens that are most commonly heard about in food environments, which are E. coli, salmonella, and listeria, and mitigating those particular pathogens uh, in the transportation part of that when getting uh, products for human consumption into the marketplace. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit, John, about what types of food transport can you decontaminate? Well, typically, our, our system is designed to be a room or an area decontamination system. Uh, we can do anything from a, a small biosafety cabinet with about 30 cubic feet all the way up to a single room uh, that can be up to 10,000 cubic feet uh, with one machine in one session. So the size of the the size of the uh, the area that we can decontaminate uh, is really relevant to the time associated with decontamination. So if you take a standard transportation box on a truck to transport products for human consumption, uh, we can probably do a, that. The internal size on that box probably in about five to ten minutes from a true fogging and decontamination system to get a uh, four to six log kill on all the pathogens that are inside that box on pre-cleaned exposed surfaces. There always has to be a gross contaminant clean uh, to get the debris and dirt off the bio bio burden that's there. Once it's relatively clean, not a sanitizing clean, but just a, a, a clean where the where the surfaces are exposed where the pathogens might be, might be lurking. Once that's been accomplished, uh, the fogger can be put in, and after a very short period of time, five to ten minutes on a standard size box, uh, that that internal side of that box will be totally decontaminated to about 99.99%. So the 99.99% is a kill ratio, so it leaves X percent alive. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's a relative term. We can't claim uh, uh, sterilization because that would be 100% kill. When we do our testing, we take a, a biological coupon, uh, which would have a, a, a stainless steel strip with a certain type, say, of Bacillus atropius, for example, which is a common pathogen that's used for testing in critical environments. 
Uh, there's usually six log on that. Six log that means a million particular on that on that particular um, coupon. So at that point in time, when we fog that, uh, when we take that in and grow it, typically nothing will grow. But that doesn't mean there aren't certain residuals there that would not present after a certain period of time. But we claim 99.99%, and basically it's a sanitized scenario where there is nothing left that is going to be able to affect any any outbreak of any pathogens in the re, in the area that we just sanitized. Outstanding. What are the current standards and disinfection methods that transportation companies are using? Well, to the best of our knowledge, we don't claim to be uh, experts in uh, this particular field per se, but what we could glean from different uh, observations and inquiries that we've received from different types of uh, transportation companies, there doesn't appear to be any consistent activity as far as setting up an SOP or protocol uh, to have a, an ongoing, uh, proactive, preventive way to decontaminate food transport vehicles. Uh, many of them are, are producing um, uh, different types of products. Uh, you have refrigerators, reefers. Uh, reefers can be particularly susceptible because uh, listeria, for example, thrives in cold environments. And I don't think refrigerated trucks are typically thought of as harboring those kinds of pathogens, but they do. Um, so as far as we can tell, there really aren't any particular uh, schemes that are being used right now other than gross contaminant cleans where they possibly might go in and hose it down or, wa or worse yet, wash it out with a power washer, which basically just blows the bio burden around and repositions it in different parts of the uh, of the, <clears throat> the inside of the truck. So there might be some there might be some protocols, some companies I've heard that might be using chlorine dioxide, or maybe some other gaseous decontamination uh, te technologies. But all of these, in in relation to hydrogen peroxide, are relatively uh, uh, hard to work with. They're dangerous. There has to be a lot of safety precautions. Uh, they're, they're very effective, but in a in an environment where you're dealing with unsophisticated uh, uh, generally speaking, unsophisticated employees who are not used to working with that type of product, it can be very, very vigorous and dangerous to use. So hydrogen peroxide is a very benign product. Uh, the byproducts are water and oxygen. So we feel that uh, the, the ease of use of this particular product could be something that could be inserted into that decontamination scheme very easily. Very good. Just tell us, what is hydrogen peroxide fogging? I'm not familiar with it at all. Hydrogen peroxide fogging has been <clears throat> around for probably 10 or 15 years. Uh, it was developed um, over in Europe. Uh, two major companies have been participating in that for the last 10 years, an English company by the name of BioQuil and another American company that most of the healthcare professionals are familiar with by the name of Steris. Uh, both these uh, companies have developed uh, very expensive delivery devices that use a 35% hydrogen peroxide solution it's heat flashed, and then it produces a hydroxyl, which is a reactive oxygen species that actually is a killing mechanism uh, that penetrates the cell wall of the pathogen and destroys the RNA. 35% uh, hydrogen peroxide, in its own right, is is a very very strong comp is a very strong uh, uh, compensation. Excuse me, is a very strong concentration of product that can be dangerous to use. The use is, a, is considered a hazardous material to ship. And the fact also that, that that concentration can be very substrate degradative to uh, all sorts of surfaces to include stainless steel, which are a concern to many of the areas in critical environments. Uh, the Sanoso product has been over in Europe for about 15 years as well. It was just brought to the United States about four years ago by an investment group that bought the, uh, bought the international marketing and manufacturing rights for the planet except for Europe. And the in the last three years, they've been developing their uh, the halo fogging delivery device, which is manufactured, designed, and engineered specifically to deliver the S10 solution. And at the same time, they were involved in receiving their EPA registration uh, from the United States Environmental Protection Agency for the use of this product in, in most environments. So it's, it's, hydrogen peroxide is not new, uh, just that the fogging aspect of it, uh, with the solution being the key to the delivery rather than the a very expensive delivery device gives us a very, very attractive price-performance ratio uh, regarding the Halo, Halo delivery device. 
Very good. You know, I really see the advantages just theoretically of a fogging device because it really penetrates a lot better than somebody with a cold wipe or, God forbid, one of those sprayers. But how does it compare to other types of decon systems? Well, the the, the advantage to having a, a this particular type of fogging technology is that the, the solution is basically a 5% hydrogen peroxide solution, pharmaceutical grade, and the other ingredient in there, there's some proprietary activators, but the other ingredient is a one-hundredth of one percent uh, silver nitrate, a positively charged silver nitrate ion called a silvercation. Uh, the combination of these two ions produces the OH radical, reactive oxygen species, if you will, that is actually the killing mechanism. The other advantage is that when you put this fogging device in an enclosed area, because the hydroxyls are, the ionic mist is positively charged, uh, the ions repel each other aggressively, and the homogeneous fog or mist, if you will, goes to every corner uh, of, a, of a particular room on any exposed surface, which would be up, around, or under any exposed surface. So you have areas that particularly wouldn't be reached by any kind of manual cleaning, or if a person happens to have a backpack sprayer on, spraying a bactericide or a sporicide or something like that. So the advantage of a, a fogging system is, number one, it's no touch takes the human air out of, out of uh, uh, a comprehensive decon in a room, you're relying on people to get to certain areas, uh, the fogging takes that out. Any, anywhere, any exposed surface in that room will be decontaminated by this process. You know, that all sounds pretty good. Let me ask you a question about government approvals. That's one thing. Our food production, food quality, food safety, and food security managers are really obsessed with. What is the government standing on your type of system there? Well, it's a, li it's a little bit nebulous. The, the EPA registration we have um, is applied to the S10 disinfectant solution, can be used as a spray, no wipe, and receive the kills, the 99.999% kill on, on all pathogens. Uh, and it's also allowed to be used adjunctively with a fogger to, to get to affect the same kill level. Uh, the other areas of approval come from regulatory agencies such as the FDA or the USDA's Food Inspection Safety Service. Uh, the Food Inspection Safety Service is the inspection arm uh, that oversees uh, meat production such as pork and beef, and uh, they are typically very amenable to new types of, of uh, decontamination protocols. And we've done some work with some of the animal labs up at the University of Florida. Uh, however, uh, typically, by definition, uh, the FDA gets involved when any kind of a decontaminant is to be used on a food contact surface or direct application to food. Uh, we feel very strongly since the, the components of this fog are, the, are hydrogen peroxide and ionic silver, which are basically benign, the byproducts are water and oxygen, can be used on to decontaminate all sorts of food products to include vegetables in a production, in a production um, uh, environment, if you will. But because the FDA has to approve it, uh, we have not gone through that regulatory process yet. So to, to not to get too, too, invo too involved, but the, the food contact surface side of it uh, would be where there are raw products that are going to be used for human consumption. Uh, if that area is decontaminated by a technology such as ours, that typically uh, might have to have uh, FDA approval. But in a food transport vehicle, most of these uh, uh, the foods that are being are either processed foods or they're already boxed up. So typically, you're not exposed to the food that's inside those containers. So what you're really trying to accomplish is decontaminating that specific area, uh, the food trans inside that food transport vehicle, and that would fall under the purview of the uh, EPA registration that we have. And the FDA considers that as generally regarded as safe category. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of the paradox here that uh, the FDA is uh, is very amenable to hydrogen peroxide type products, uh, and they in any a lot of the hydrogen peroxide products that are now out there um, that have not gone through the approval, their own testing shows that they generally regard hydrogen peroxide decontamination as GROSS, which is an acronym for generally regarded as safe. That's not to say they they don't want to be involved in 
in, in, in issuing an FDA approval for products that are going to be used on a regular and consistent basis in that environment. It's a little bit of a paradox. They say that they, they consider this product safe for use, but on the other hand, they want to make sure that, uh, I guess, they get their pound of flesh, if you will, before they're going to approve anything for that type of environment. But the applications that we're talking about here typically uh, in food transport vehicles, we think it's an excellent application, and the EPA registration uh, gives us all the regulatory authority we think we need uh, to decontaminate those portions of the truck anyway. There's no food products in there typically when they're there, and they're mostly generally boxed and wouldn't be exposed to any, any type of residual which is risen on anyway. So you're sort of parsing words here as far as the regulatory side of it. Well, John, let me interrupt you here. Just clarify in my mind. How does this work? So when you have an empty vessel, a truck or a trailer is what you're saying, you come in and you do your work, and then the vehicle is then sanitized and ready for another shipment. Is that right? Yeah, typically when we do any 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 area or room, the first thing that has to happen is a is what we call a gross contaminant clean, uh, which is where uh, dirt, debris, uh, dried anything is is clean. The reason for that is that underneath uh, these this dirt and debris, there could be potentially a uh, a bio burden or a residual uh, colony forming unit be lurking. It could be anything that is, that can live outside the host, and many of these pathogens form what we call, call biofilms, which are a viscous substance, basically a polysaccharide-based uh, viscous substance that is produced to protect these organisms when they're outside of the body. And they can, they can exist under this biofilm for months outside the host. And a lot of these, uh, these colony-forming units covered by this biofilm uh, could potentially be under all this debris or dirt that's dried on that floor. So... If you don't get that off before you fog, we can't go through the dirt and debris. We can defeat biofilms because our uh, oxidative process will, will defeat the polysaccharide bonds, and then we go in to defeat the pathogen by, once again, lysing the cell wall and destroying the RNA. So the, the essence of really getting the, the truck sanitized, the inside of the truck, would be to get as much debris off the floor and walls as possible before fogging. Once that's accomplished, uh, you would put the halo fogger, which is about a 50-pound device, very easy to move around, inside the uh, inside the truck. You shut the doors. You can tape the doors if you wish. The idea is not to have a hermetic seal, but the idea is to prevent really disruptive air flows from, from uh, moving the homogeneous fog around too much. You want that uh, the repelling nature of the positively charged ions to do its job inside by itself. And once, if you do that, um, you calculate the, t the time uh, to be fogged by a matrix that's on the back of a halo fogging device. It's basically involved in, in volume, which would be cubic feet of the area that you're trying to decontaminate, length, width, and height. You calculate the number of cubic feet. Uh, you look on the back, it'll say um, 400 cubic feet would be an eight-minute fog. Mm -hmm. uh, you set the timer on the device. It's got a one-minute delay. You walk out the door, you shut the door, or if you wish to throw tape over it, you can do that. Uh, you might want to put a sign on it, say fogging in process, do not occupy. Uh, you calculate the time that is involved in fogging. Uh, at the end of that time, you give it another 10 minutes to dwell. Just open the doors, and that will normally aspirate itself probably in another 15 to 20 minutes, and that truck is ready for reoccupation. And at that time... So let, me get this straight. Uh, let me get this straight, John. So you have the operator, which is not going to be a Ph.D. in microbiology, do a gross right. cleaning, as they normally do, then stick this machine in there, press a couple of buttons, close it up, and then it turns itself off. Is that what you're saying? Yes. It, uh, there's an automatic the timer. will. There's a one-minute delay, uh, which gives the operator a time to get out of the, uh, the inside of the truck. Uh, the fogging process will take place. At the end, when the timer is completed, it's an uh, eight-minute or ten-minute cycle, whatever the calculations on the back show according to the... Uh, total number of cubic feet inside the truck. Uh, the, the machine sets itself off, and at that particular time, you can, I would let it dwell, let the fog dwell for another 10 minutes before you open up the door. Open up the doors. Uh, the natural aspiration will occur very quickly. This is a very low concentration of hydrogen peroxide, only 5%, so it dissipates very quickly. Uh, the fogging process has uh, decontaminated uh, the inside of that truck uh, to 99.999%. Uh, all pathogens that are in there that are exposed to the fog will be eliminated. 
So let me ask you a question, John. I'm just thinking of how things normally operate. What if some guy just got a big face full of that gas or that aspiration? What would happen? Well, if they if they it would it, it would be at that concentration, it would be considered a mild lung irritant. I've actually stayed in a room during a fogging session, and uh, I, it is a long mild, a mild lung irritant. But that's after prolonged exposure of say five minutes. It also turned my hair orange, which is another benefit that I used to like when I was a teenager. But uh, it really is at that concentration, uh, a quick whiff of that is not going to be any is not going to be uh, harmful whatsoever. I would not want to expose myself to prolonged foggings uh, over a period of time because that can that can become a uh, a residual problem. On the other hand, for example, if you were dealing with a product, uh, another technology such as the BioQuill or the Steris product that I mentioned earlier that uses a 35% hydrogen peroxide solution, if you went inside that room during that fogging session, you might not survive. So there's a big difference between the concentrations. That's why this, there's a big advantage using this 5%. It's relatively benign. It's, uh, it's, it's the oxidative potential of that particular product are such that takes care of the biofilms and producing the, the hydroxyls, which is the killing mechanism. But if that concentration, it is not substrate degradative, uh, where it will not hurt anything over prolonged use. Now that includes uh, any sort of electronics, because we work in the healthcare environment a lot. We can leave sensitive electronics like keyboards and all sorts of monitors and testing equipment inside the, a room when it's fog, and it's a dry mist. It will not harm uh, any of the electronics because as soon as the dry mist hits the surface, it kills the pathogen. If there's one on there or a group or a coliforming unit, it, it uh, immediately evaporates, it turns into water and oxygen, and it evaporates. Uh, so there's nothing left, no, resi no residual. You don't have to wipe anything. So that's the advantage of the system in that concentration. Well, Joe, let me ask you. So the end user will buy or rent your system, and where do they get their consumables? How does that all work? Typically, at this price, most of the other um, fogging devices on the market, and I might mention briefly that uh, as far as other decontamination, uh, airy decontamination systems, the other ones would be other gaseous uh, technologies, such as chlorine dioxide and possibly paraformaldehyde. Those are typically used in, in laboratory or clean room environments under control conditions. Uh, I would not really like to see uh, uh, anybody use that in a commercial environment. I just think it's too dangerous. The, other, the only other uh, area decontamination uh, technologies being used on a regular basis, most of it in healthcare, and in some, in some cases in food as well, are UV light systems. Uh, the UV light systems that are used for area decontamination are devices with a, with a variety of bulbs, and they're placed inside the container, and they will once again de decontaminate anything with inside that container, but only on line of sight. So if you have something that's uh, under something or behind something or it's shadowed, for example, uh, then that UV light system will not decontaminate any bio burden that happens to be there. Plus, these systems are very expensive, uh, normally way north of $50,000. So our device at our cost performance area is, is extremely attractive and makes a uh, the cost to decontaminate the inside of a truck very inexpensive. Uh, we can we can figure a thousand cubic feet uh, would cost at retail for the solution, which is the S10 solution that goes in the fogger, about two dollars and fifty cents thousand cubic feet. So if you have a five hundred cubic foot truck bed, uh, you can you can calculate what cost you about a dollar and a quarter in true solution cost to decontaminate that. Uh, that the inside of that particular truck, notwithstanding the cost of the halo fogger, which is relatively inexpensive in its own right. So the end user would buy the unit or rent it from you. How does that work? Well, typically we are um, uh, we are a sales and service organization. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, a service group in San Diego and also here in Florida uh, that does service particular. Right now, most uh, most uh, prominently on critical environments. We've been in the pharmaceutical clean room, the biotech area, the vivarium area, academic labs for a number of years, and that's where most of our service activity is entailed. Uh, what we would probably think would be the most uh, realistic way to approach it would have a an enlightened carrier, for example, that is a food transport carrier that sees this technology as something that could be 
be worked into their uh, their scheme as far as their decontamination SOPs and write something around it and embrace it by the units themselves, train their own people uh, to, to use the unit uh, for the end of end of clean decontamination which gives them that 99.999% kill. The other possible way, and this is something I'm not personally familiar with, is service companies that might work for carriers that do that on a fee-for-service basis, i.e. do the, the cleaning of the inside of the trucks. Uh, at that time, you might approach that type of service company, uh, either the carrier themselves or the service company approaches the carrier and said, I have new technology here that you might want to look at that gives us an exceptional sanitization uh, that you, uh, if you've had problems in, in, in transporting or any pathogen outbreaks, you might want to look at this. Or just preventively, uh, to, re to, to uh, prevent any potential outbreaks, here's something that will certainly eliminate or mitigate that potential. Copy. Well, John, you know, I'm just thinking, is this thing so big that one person can carry it, or does it need two or three people to lug it around from trailer to trailer? No, if it's uh, the device is, is, is got a very small footprint. It's about 18 inches by 18 inches by about 41 inches tall. It weighs about 50 pounds. It's a, a very durable device. It's on wheels. It's got handles that can be rolled around very easily, even by a, by a, a female. Many nurses use it to move from room to room. Uh, it, it might be a 50-pound device. Might be a little heavy with with the, with, the, with the solution in it. It's about 60 pounds. Uh, it might be a little heavy for a woman to lift up in a truck. But if you're if you're working with, uh, of course, with gentlemen that are doing the cleaning, that's not an issue for a. Uh, to lift the 50-pound device up inside the truck. So it's very portable, very durable, uh, very simple to use. So the training associated with using this device would not be anywhere near as comprehensive as you would have to use for any other type of, of, of comprehensive decontamination uh, protocol that they might be uh, looking at. Understood. John, you've been an excellent guest. Can you let our listeners, again, food production, food safety, food quality, and food security managers know about any other future projects or programs that your company may be engaging in? Well, we think that the food, uh, the food processing area is, a, is a, a really large, needy area for a comprehensive decontamination uh, scheme. Over and above the direct areas that the FDA has purview over, which are food contact surfaces and direct contact to food, there's many other areas in, in the food environment that I think could, could benefit from this type of technology. Uh, inside cold rooms, um, uh, inside the just general areas of activity where uh, food is uh, handled for human consumption. Any of these areas have potential cross-contamination from a variety of pathogens, not just the Salmonella, E. coli, and Listeria I mentioned, but all the other community-based infections that are now coming out of the hospital, such as MRSA, uh, norovirus, which has been is considered a uh, cruise ship malady, has now become community-based and is the number one concern in the healthcare environment. It's getting into all sorts of areas like nursing homes. But anybody that's exposed in a hospital, it now becomes community-based because people are so so mobile. So these potential pathogens are also could be, you could have an infected person who hasn't presented yet, could be handling cartons or containers, and there, there could be a residual bio burden on there that might have potential uh, to come into a food, into an area where the uh, food is being used for human consumption. It could be very, very dangerous. And norovirus particularly is very, very, um, uh, it's not as dangerous per se as something like Clostridium difficile or MRSA, but it is certainly a very contagious uh, pathogen that has to be contended with. Uh, most of our other projects right now uh, are involved in healthcare, uh, hospitals, uh, surgical centers, uh, medical transportation, such as ambulances, so what we can do with the inside of an ambulance, which would be similar to the inside of a truck in about five minutes. They have huge cross-contamination problems because of the people and the demographic of the patients that they're moving around between the hospitals and doctors and back home. Uh, and we'll continue to work aggressively in, um, in critical environments, um, uh, BSL labs, biosafety labs, uh, clean rooms, biotech, medical device decontamination. But the areas for use of this product are almost unlimited. Uh, doctor's offices, labs, uh, blood mobiles, dialysis centers, uh, health clubs. Uh, hey, John, spas. what about it's airplanes? Cool. I travel a lot, and I, I sit in those boxes with two, 300 people coughing, sneezing. I, I just yep. It makes my hair curl. 
Well, municipal transportation, which would include planes and trains, are also uh, great candidates for decontamination. Uh, if you took the inside of a 737, for example, we could put four machines in the aisles of that of that uh, uh, that airliner, and I would presume I'm not sure how many cubic feet are in a 737, but uh, it's not not a not a huge number. We could probably do that plane in less than a half an hour, uh, and that plane would be decontaminated. Now, the other area that's uh, that's popped up is uh, hospitality. Uh, there's a couple. There's a, the, the largest chain in the world right now is implementing some. Uh, uh, some hyper-cleaning te uh, te technologies using UV, a black light to identify a bio bird, and then a UV wand to uh, to eliminate that bio bird. We think that the, the Sanisol device has some great potential there because particularly international travel or business travelers, uh, having a hyper-sanitized room where most of the bio bird in that room is killed is going to keep those, tra those business travelers healthy and therefore productive. So any place where there's people, where people have are sick, and people can those sick people can potentially contaminate other people. Uh, school school facilities, for example, school uh, health clubs, uh, the gyms, MRSA and staff are, are always a problem, and they affect the most uh, prestigious of athletes. We're, we're also getting a lot of interest from the professional sports teams and the high end college teams because of these very expensive athletes. Um, we can uh, what's a ten million dollar football player worth to get the staff infection is me and can't play that year. Uh, there's a lot of halos that could be sold for that kind of money. So the, the, the applications are virtually unlimited. Uh, they're just left to the imagination. And the advantage here is that the price-performance ratio on this device is so attractive that from a capital perspective, it opens up all sorts of other markets here to four would not be able to afford to even look at that technology when it's tens of thousands of dollars more than this device. But what we do, it's, uh, it's an exceptional value. Well, John... I don't know if you know this, but I worked at a company called Cepheid, and we were the government's contractor for the U.S. Postal Service to screen all U.S. mail for an organism called anthrax. I don't know if you recall, back yeah. in 2001, our country was attacked yes, I by do. a bioweapon. And yeah. I've often looked back at the remediation efforts that were made at the Senate office building and several other buildings, and I've often thought, you know, they were out there with swabs and a cold application. Just looking back, how would this instrument have helped in those decontamination efforts back then? Well, actually, um, there were a lot of manual cleaning, but the company that I mentioned earlier, BioQuill, uh, was brought in uh, to do a certain amount of decontamination work there. Um, yes, to answer your question, the, the, the manual cleaning processes are very inefficient. Uh, most studies show that even the comprehensive, even a tertiary or a, a super clean on an area. Now, there are yet some very, some people that are a little more high quality as far as your attention uh, area in getting to the, to the Senate buildings, of course. You're going to get a little better clean, but you're only still getting 60 to 70 percent. That's why a comprehensive scheme like a fogging scheme or a, they even might have brought chlorine dioxide or, or something else in there to do that. Anthrax is a deadly a deadly uh, pathogen. However, it is very easy to kill. It is one of the easiest uh, products to kill that we fought. So there are no issues with destroying that pathogen with our with our technology. To answer your question, yes, that would have been a perfect application. Uh, you could have taken uh, a number of scenes, put them inside that building, and you would have been guaranteed that uh, any residual uh, anthrax spores that were left uh, would have been compromised. Well, John, you've been an amazing guest bring this new technology to the food area. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of our many, many listeners who are professionals in food safety. Do you have any closing remarks for them? Well, I, I, once again, Andy, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to present this technology. And uh, I think that um, uh, food safety has been something that, that we have explored over the uh, the last number of years, and the regulatory side of it became a little onerous for us, so we sort of backed away from it. But then we started thinking about all the other ancillary types of, of activities that could benefit from this technology in food transport, and the one we're talking about today is the big one. I think it's a neglected area. Uh, I think anybody that's transporting uh, any products that are going to be used for human consumption could benefit from this technology, and uh, I think that as 
as people think about it and get their arms around how easy this technology is to use and the price benefit associated with having a device that's going to kill 99.999% of any pathogen that's of concern to them, I think that's a big advantage. So I think this is going to open up a lot of eyes and maybe uh, uh, people can sit down and start looking at, at the ways to use this technology that they possibly hadn't thought about thought about before. In other words, thinking outside the box. And that's where this, uh, this technology becomes very exciting. And unfortunately, um, if you knew what I knew and are, are, are privy to some of the blogs that I see what's, uh, what's coming our way from across the pond, particularly India, uh, you probably wouldn't leave, get out of bed in the morning or go outside. It's some very dangerous things coming along. And unfortunately, the potential for a pandemic in, a, in the very near future involving some very nasty bugs is, uh, is going to happen. It's not uh, if, it's when. And this kind of device can respond to anything like that, and I think it's something that um, overall is a, it opens up a whole new area based on the price-performance ratio. I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, we're, the people are going to embrace, and it can offer some definite benefits, particularly in food transport processing. Well, John, thank you again for your time and, you know, and your son, AJ, as well, and his participation. How would somebody contact you? if they were interested in investigating your device further? Uh, we, you can go to our website at www.medeffect, M-E-D-E-F-F-E-C-T, 360.com. Um, it's got a full, uh, the, that website is a healthcare-oriented website, but the, the applications are definitely there. All of our literature uh, is under the Resource Center uh, in PDF format, and that includes uh, the MSDS, the Material Safety Data Sheet, the EPA regulation, and all of our literature. Um, our 800 number is there, or else you can contact me personally, John Barton at 305-942-1247. Very good, John. Appreciate your time, and wish you the best of success. We have had a lot of challenges in food. And I'll just let you know, I work on the production side in a surveillance capacity, surveilling the food before it reaches the shipping dock. Once it reaches the shipping dock, the food producer has very little control if it's a third-party trucker. And the challenge right. is a lot of these food producers, their products are being surveilled by the FDA or USDA program, and there is no real causal connection or trail from their ship point to their test point, for example, out of a grocery store. So your technology may be a very nice augmentation to the entire food chain from farm to fork, as the saying goes. Yeah, I think that would, would help the audit trail, that's for sure, Andy. Plus, um, I think what's going to have to happen, like in many industries, I think that the customers, uh, such as a supermarket or a, or a restaurant chain or whomever is the recipient, of the food that's being transported. Uh, we're doing some work right now with some of these organizations, these big, these big multi-chain uh, uh, food companies, to, to let them know what this technology can do, and maybe they, uh, looking at this technology, might approach their, their food transport companies and say, we might like you to look at this. We were thinking about possibly incorporating a standard operating procedure that would use this, and if you want to be our transport company, uh, you will use this or something similar from a, uh, a more comprehensive decontamination scheme. It's going to have to be pressure on all fronts uh, to make people yeah, respond. Yeah. Uh, they take the path of least resistance, but this particular device offers so many opportunities for prevention and mitigation that I think everybody's going to sooner or later start having to pay attention to it. And the more pressure they get from a variety of different angles, I think the sooner that will happen. Real quick, Andy, uh, uh, Dad, a, po a point that I want to draw upon would be perhaps we can draw the, co the comparison and, and bring in a, you know, an additional perspective to this from a quality assurance standpoint. Is what, Dad, why don't you talk briefly about how infection control in the clinical environment was once and for many years perceived as a cost, but now is being perceived as a revenue generator. Perhaps we can uh, draw a comparison uh, to the food safety world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to make an apples and apples comparison, but as, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, what's driving the bus right now in the healthcare industry to look at more comprehensive decontamination technologies 
is the, uh, the Medicare Reimbursement Act of 2008, uh, which stipulates full implementation is just being reached this year, by the way, which stipulates that Medicare and Medicaid <clears throat> will not reimburse hospitals or any post-op uh, hospital-acquired infection can be identified, and that includes readmissions. So you can calculate that it costs a, a, a hospital about a ten about ten thousand dollars a week for a post-op MRSA patient, and they're typically in there about a month to cure that if they make it. Uh, so that used to be a revenue generator. Now it's going to the other end, so it's not. It has to come off. They can't build a patient. So now it's a negative. It's negative on the bottom line. So they're allocating, reallocating those monies that they're now losing into looking at preventive schemes. And that's not to say that the food transport industry is going to have anywhere near those kinds of issues financially. But if they do have an outbreak, uh, a comprehensive decontamination of all their trucks, if something like that occurs, can be a very, very extensive proposition. And not to mention the PR, the bad press that's associated with uh, having a carrier have that kind of an outbreak, can be devastating. So a lot of our people that uh, that are using our healthcare pro in healthcare now are using this to to reduce their insurance premiums, which can also be a consideration as far as food transport is concerned, and also using it as a marketing tool, saying we are hyper-cleaning and sanitizing our trucks or our facilities or our surgical centers or our ambulances or whatever. It can be applied unilaterally across all these vertical markets. Using it as a, mar a proactive marketing tool, saying we offer this level of sanitization. When you travel here to our hotel, we have done this with this room. Uh, all those are considerations. So. Once the mindset is there, that this benefit, uh, cost benefit is there and can be achieved for a very nominal amount of money, uh, the marketing potential and the mitigation and just the preventive aspects of it become very attractive to a whole, whole different uh, uh, type of customer. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. And I'd like to now close the program with a sincere appreciation for your, both of your time and the excellent content which you provided to our program. Thank, Thank you very you much. Andy. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Andy. Appreciate your time. Bye. Yeah, bye now.